Welcome to this video lecture on uh, compressible flow through a converging nozzle. So in the last lecture, we talked about isentropic flow with changes in area. So we talked about how when you deal with subsonic flow or supersonic flow, you get different behavior and that you need to go um, to, if you're at a Mach number one, it'll occur at a minimum area. And today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about flow specifically through just a converging nozzle. We won't worry about those Delaval or converging diverging nozzles until a um, couple of lectures from now. But today we'll just focus on converging nozzles and there's some interesting things that happen there. So let's go ahead and take a look at the screen. You'll see a picture. This, uh, this picture set of pictures comes from a publication down here is the reference. And I thought it was kind of interesting. It's really a paper that was focusing on laser cutting of sheets of metal and things like that. And one of the things that they do for this laser cutting is they actually uh, spray a, um, a jet of oxygen and then they have a high powered laser and that does some cutting of the metal. And they were interested in knowing uh, the when you make the cuts just how the debris sort of moves off the material. So one of the things that they were looking at was just what that high speed jet of oxygen looks like as it uh, comes through the through the material, through the cut. And so they set up some pictures of that high-speed jet of oxygen coming through uh, some nozzles, and the nozzles had different configurations. So uh, the nozzles A, B, and C all are, are just uh, converging conical nozzles. So it's kind of the kind of topic we're going to talk about today, just converging nozzles. And then these three over here are different. Um, and I can't remember offhand what the MLN stands for, but it, they're basically converging diverging nozzles. So you can see some very different behavior coming out of these. By the way, these images are Schlieren photography images. Schlieren photography, I think I've mentioned in a previous lecture, it's just an imaging technique for uh, high speed uh, gas flows. Basically, it, it looks at the density differences in the gas, the gradient of the density differences in the gas. And where you have a large density gradient, you get um, a change in color here. But it, they can help visualize the, the flow behavior. And the things that I want to I want to highlight in the image really are the, on the three on the left, since those are the converging only nozzles. But you see that the flow comes out. You can see that it sort of expands as it comes out. In fact, I think um, the pressure increases as we go from left to right. Yeah, for for nozzle A, it's four bars pressure, stagnation pressure. Nozzle B, it's seven bars. Nozzle C, it's 10 bars. So you can see that the pressure increases as you go from A to B to C. And you see that when the jet comes out, it sort of expands here. And the higher the, the pressure upstream, the, the more it expands. Then you get this kind of complicated behavior, this sort of diamond shapes. Um, these we'll talk about uh, a little bit more when we talk about converging diverging nozzles. Um, but the, the thing I want to just talk about are these kind of expansion, this expansion of the gas, because we're going to talk about that. You'll see another picture of it later in, in the lecture. Now, with the converging diverging nozzles, you also see these really kind of neat diamond shaped patterns. We'll talk about that a couple of lectures from now. They're called uh, mock diamonds or shock diamonds, and they're phenomena that, that occur due to the compressibility of the gas. You get regions of shock waves and reason, regions of what are called expansion fans. And the way they interact with the atmosphere produces these kinds of interesting patterns. So some pretty pictures related to the topic we're going to talk about today. So we're going to talk about flow through a converging diverging, or I'm sorry, here a converging nozzle. And one of the first things we get that is kind of an interesting phenomenon is this phenomenon of choked flow. And what that means is that if you pressurize a tank like you see in the the picture here, you have this tank, it's at stagnation conditions, it's nominally zero velocity in that tank. You have this converging nozzle that choke flow means that at, as I start to decrease this back pressure, we'll get flow through the nozzle, but there'll come a point where we reach a maximum flow rate out of the nozzle. You won't get any higher flow rate by changing the back pressure. So it's called choked flow because you can't get any more mass flow rate out of it. Now let me just physically describe how the whole process works. So let's imagine we start with the back pressure. And so the back pressure is the pressure we're discharging into. So we're starting at stagnation conditions. We're going into this back pressure. And if the back pressure is 
equal to the stagnation pressure, then nothing happens because there's no pressure difference. You have to have a pressure difference to push the flow through the nozzle, right? So if it's at stagnation conditions, nothing happens. So let's now drop the back pressure a little bit. Now there's some pressure difference and that pressure difference will push the air through the nozzle. And so what'll happen is the, the flow will go from stagnation conditions it's going through a converging nozzle, so the velocity will increase, the Mach number will increase. So in this region, you're getting an increase in the Mach number. It's, it's subsonic because we haven't gone through a minimum area yet. Remember that um, in order to go, if you're starting from stagnation conditions and you want to get to supersonic conditions, you have to go through a minimum area first, right? Because it, you'll have to decrease the area to increase the Mach number, so it approaches a value of one. But to get to a value of one, you know that that has to occur at a minimum area. And here we're not at in, in minimum area. The minimum area is really right at the throat, right at the, the narrowest part. So in this converging section, we know the Mach number will be subsonic always because it's starting from stagnation conditions. It hasn't gone through a minimum area yet, so it has to be subsonic. So we have subsonic flow through the converging section. And then right at the throat here, which is just right at the exit. That's the minimum area. Um, if, if we don't drop the back pressure too much, what'll happen there is just the, we'll have the highest velocity there and that'll be it. It'll be the highest Mach number. It's still not a Mach number one, it's still subsonic. And, um, and then you just get flow coming out of the, out of the nozzle. Nothing too particularly exciting uh, at this point. And because we have subsonic flow at the exit, what ends up happening is the pressure at the throat will equal the surrounding back pressure. We, now we've talked before about free jets, when you have a jet of liquid or jet of gas that's exiting some um, you know, tank, when it goes out into the atmosphere, it'll have the same pressure as the surrounding atmosphere. It turns out that's actually only true for subsonic flows, that if you have a supersonic flow, that doesn't have to be true. It's only for subsonic flows, that that's true. Um, and we'll talk more about that when we talk about converging, diverging nozzles. But at, at this point, since the flow at the exit is still subsonic, the pressure at the throat will be the same as the surrounding back pressure. So if, if the Mach number is at the throat is less than one, then what that means is the exit pressure or the throat pressure in this case is equal to the back pressure because it'll just have the same pressure as the, the surrounding pressure, okay? Now let's drop the back pressure a little bit further, okay? So we're gonna keep dropping the back pressure here. And as I drop the back pressure, what ends up happening is every time I change the back pressure, there's a little sound wave that propagates upstream. Let me just kind of sketch that in here. So if I drop the back pressure, what happens is there'll be a sound wave that'll propagate its way upstream. And that's what informs the tank that the, there's a pressure gradient. Right? You, you have to, every time I drop this back pressure, I have to communicate that information, or that information gets communicated, I don't do it personally, but that information is communicated upstream to the tank, and so then the tank recognizes, well, there's now a pressure gradient, and it'll see a larger pressure gradient, and it'll push more fluid through that nozzle. Okay, so every time I do that, every time I change that back pressure, there's a sound wave that propagates upstream. Now the speed of that sound wave is just the speed of sound, right? So it's traveling upstream at the local speed of sound. So it'll just go at the local speed of sound C, okay? So as I continue to drop the back pressure, the, there's a larger and larger pressure gradient. More flow goes through that converging nozzle. We get a higher mass flow rate. We also get uh, Mach numbers that start to increase. It's still all subsonic inside the converging section because it's converging. We haven't gone through a minimum area, so it's still subsonic. But what, what ends up happening is the Mach numbers increase. They get larger and larger. And the largest Mach number will be right at the throat here. And at some point, I'll reach a Mach number equal to one. Okay, so if I, if I drop the back pressure enough, the flow will go through faster and faster and faster. And eventually, I'll reach a Mach number of one at the throat. And it'll occur right at the throat because that's the minimum area. If you're gonna have a Mach number one anywhere, it has to be at the minimum area. So it'll be right at the throat. So that's a special case. We've dropped the back pressure to, to a critical value such that at the throat, the Mach number is equal to one. So let me, let me erase this 
and uh, start with it being a little fresh here. So we, what we're saying is we've dropped the back pressure now such that right at the throat we have a Mach number equal to one. Okay. Now at that point, of course we know that the conditions there are sonic conditions. So we know that the pressure at the throat will be P star because it's a Mach number one. And of course we know the area of the throat will be A star and uh, the density at the throat will be density star, etc. They're all sonic conditions because the Mach number is equal to one there. And when I just reach that Mach number one, then um, of course the back when I when I just get to that point, the back pressure will be equal to P star, just as I because I, you know, I'm, I'm dropping, I'm dropping the back pressure. The whole flow is subsonic. The exit pressure is equal to the back pressure. But I just reached the point where I've dropped the back pressure enough that the back pressure is equal to P star, and then suddenly, right at the um, right at the throat, the the throat pressure is P star because the Mach number is one there, and that that's a critical point. Now, if I drop if I drop the back pressure further from that point, what ends up happening is I try to when I drop that back pressure further, we'll get another sound wave, and it'll try to propagate upstream, but Keep in mind, it's going at the speed of sound, but now we have flow coming out of the throat that's at a Mach number one. So that means that the, the velocity is equal to the speed of sound. So we've got one wave trying to go upstream. This is the, because I've dropped the back pressure further, that there's a sound wave that's trying to go upstream in the nozzle, but the nozzle flow velocity is going the same speed out. So what ends up happening is that sound wave never makes it past the throat it doesn't make its way upstream. So now inside the tank, it doesn't recognize that the back pressure has changed because none of that information is propagated up past the throat. Once that, once that Mach number is equal to one right at the throat there, right at the exit, then any further decrease in back pressure never makes its way upstream because it can't get past this throat because the flow going out is the same as the sound wave trying to go upstream and so it, it never makes it there. So even then, if I continue to drop the back pressure, the, the tank here won't send any more fluid through because it doesn't recognize that the pressure gradient has changed. So it, it won't send any more flow through and that's what we call choked flow conditions. We, changing the back pressure, you know, continuing to drop it won't make a difference because the tank never recognizes that there's any difference there. That's what we call choked flow conditions. And by the way, if I continue to drop the back pressure below that, that P star value, the, the critical value that gives me a Mach number of one right at the exit, the throat still stays at a Mach number of one because it's, it's a minimum area. That's where the Mach number will be one. The conditions at the throat won't change. So even though the back pressure is less than P star, remember it's P star right at the throat because the Mach number is one there. So the, the pressure at the throat is P star the back pressure can actually be lower than P star. So this is now something different that um, we haven't seen before. We have this jet that's coming out of the tank, but now the pressure in the jet is actually higher than the back pressure because the back pressure keeps dropping, but the Mach number at the throat is still one. So it has to be P star there. The back pressure is lower than that. This will look a little better when I start plotting things out. I'm just kind of describing it in words for a moment. I'm going to repeat myself again, but this I'll, I'll do it again with a plot to hopefully make it'll make more sense there. I just wanted to give you a physical idea of what choked flow is because it's this idea that we drop every time we drop the back pressure, there's a sound wave that propagates upstream to let the tank know that there's a pressure gradient, that the pressure gradient's changed and to push more fluid through there. But when the flow at the throat reaches a Mach number of one, we can no longer communicate information upstream because the sound waves can't make their way upstream because the, the, the speed of sound of the waves trying to go upstream equal the velocity of the, the fluid coming out. And so it just doesn't make its way up there. So that's what results in this choked flow condition. Now we can actually calculate what the mass flow rate is for choked flow conditions. And I'm not gonna derive it. If you look at my book style notes, you'll see the derivation for it, but I'll just tell you how it comes about. You just take, you just do the calculation for the mass flow rate. I'll just get it started here. You just do the mass flow rate, but you use sonic conditions. You do it at the mass flow rate when the Mach number is equal to one. So you just 
start with the mass flow rate, just density times velocity times the area. But what we want to do is calculate the mass flow rate at sonic conditions. So that's why all those terms have a star in them. And then what we do is we make use of our isentropic relations at those sonic conditions. So we remember we had an expression for rho star over rho naught. So we could plug that in there. V star is just the velocity when the Mach number is 1. So V star is equal to C star, just the speed of sound. We also had an expression for C star over C naught. We could substitute in here. And you also know that um, A star is just the area when the Mach number is 1. When the Mach number is 1 here, that'll be A star. OK. Let me ask you a quick question here, just, just for you to think about it. Let me erase this stuff. Let's say the Mach number at the throat is less than 1. Is the area at the throat equal to A star? It's not, because the Mach number is not equal to 1 there. It's subsonic, so the area of the throat is not equal to A star. Right? For those conditions, the, the throat is not A star. But if I keep dropping the back pressure, at some point the Mach number at the throat will be equal to 1. So let me just call this throat. So we know that at some point the Mach number at the throat will equal to 1 because I've dropped the back pressure enough. Once we reach that case, then the area of the throat will be equal to A star. Okay, It has to do with the fact that the, the, the upstream conditions are, are different. It just, the, 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 the flow, the Mach numbers are changing up upstream. Um, and so um, the A over A star values change. So basically, it's just important. Uh, what I really want you to recognize is you only have A star when the Mach number is 1. Okay. All right, so getting back to the choke flow mass flow rate. So we, we start with just the, our regular expression for the mass flow rate. We use sonic conditions. And you do some algebra involved. And it's not critical, you know, the algebra. But you'll end up with the following expression. So this is the maximum the max mass flow rate you'll get um, for a tank at a given set of is different at, is at a given set of stagnation conditions. So you'll see here it depends on your sta uh, specific heat ratio and your stagnation conditions p naught and t naught, and then you have a star, which will be the area of the throat when the Mach number is one there. You can still get higher mass flow rates from a tank. If I go back to this this picture. I can still get a higher mass flow rate from this tank if I change my stagnation conditions. Right? If I, if I pressurize this, make it a higher pressure, you'll see that the mass flow rate will increase. What choke flow means is I can't get a higher mass flow rate by changing the back pressure. I can't, I can't drop this any further to make a, a larger mass flow rate through here. The only way I can get a larger mass flow rate through here at when it becomes choked is by changing the stagnation conditions so that it's just higher. It's higher pressure or uh, a difference in the temperature. Okay. By the way, I should point out that this pressure and temperature, those, those come from the ideal gas law. Those should be absolute properties. Okay. So let me now go through this whole explanation again, but in a more graphical form. Okay. So we're going to look at flow from this tank again through a converging nozzle. Don't worry about these expansion fans and things like that just yet. We're going to get to that. What I really want to focus on are these two plots down here. So ignore the, the plots in the top. Actually, it's these three plots. So what we're going to do is imagine this whole scenario again, but I just want to plot everything out. What we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to have our tank. Let me draw it. Oops, that's not the best place to draw it. We're going to have our tank, converging nozzle, I have the back pressure, stagnation pressure. And what I'm going to do is go through this whole scenario again, but I'm going to change the back pressure over the stagnation pressure, PB over P0. We'll just hold the stagnation pressure constant and just change the back pressure. So you can see that here. Here's a plot of pressure, P over P0, as a function of position. So the idea here is, let me see if I can draw this. Here's our tank, and then it's the converging. I, <laughs> it's pretty terrible scale. In fact, that looks awful. Let's try this again. But basically, this is the, the converging section of the... Um, let me draw it just as a center line. So this is the converging section out to the exit 
Okay, so you have stagnation conditions up here, then we have our converging nozzle, the flow is going this way. And what, you're, what we're plotting is the pressure at any point in the nozzle. You can see here X is just a position in the nozzle. And then right here is our, our throat. Oops, don't know what happened there. So right here is our, our throat, kind of our minimum area. And so what we're going to do is start with the back pressure at a high value. So if it's equal to 1, let's say the back pressure PB over P0 is equal to 1, then the back pressure is equal to the stagnation pressure. There's no flow. There's nothing driving the flow. And so the pressure everywhere would just be the stagnation pressure. It would just be a horizontal line. Nothing interesting. And then what ends up happening, oh, and by the way, if that's the case, then the pressure at the throat, this is the pressure at the throat divided by the stagnation pressure. Here again is the back pressure divided by the stagnation pressure. So if it's equal to 1 here, then the pressure at the throat is equal to 1 because there's no flow. And the mass flow rate, so here's PB over P0. This is mass flow rate. So the, P, the mass flow rate is 0. Because, again, back pressure is equal to stagnation pressure. There's no flow anywhere in the device. Now what I'm going to do is decrease the back pressure a little bit. So I'm going to decrease the back pressure maybe to this point. Uh, let me fix that. So we're now down to this point. So the back pressure over the stagnation pressure is a little bit less than 1. So now we get some flow through the device. And what you'll see is that the pressure will decrease in the nozzle. And then at the exit, the Mach number there at the, at the throat is subsonic. Subsonic everywhere, even at the throat. And so you can see that the exit pressure, or the throat pressure, is the same as the back pressure. Right? And you can see that over here. Here's the back pressure. Let's say we're at, at this point now. So the back pressure is less than the stagnation pressure. But because the exit is subsonic, the throat pressure will be exactly equal to the back pressure. And our mass flow rate, for that case, will be somewhere here. We're getting some mass flow rate because we've dropped the back pressure a little bit, and we're getting some flow. And then if we continue to drop the back pressure, let me put this one in a different color. So let's say we're to this point. Here again, the, the Mach number at the throat is less than 1. So you, know, you can see the pressure is decreased in the nozzle. But right at the exit, since it's subsonic there, it'll be the same pressure as the back pressure. That point corresponds perhaps right to this one, so we dropped it there. Here the throat pressure is equal to the back pressure because it's subsonic there. And then maybe our mass flow rate is right over here. So we've, we've got more mass flow rate because we've decreased the back pressure further. Now let's go to the critical case. Now what we're going to do is drop the back pressure to a critical point. Let me... Uh, Put this one in a different color here. So we're, we're now at this point. The back pressure is now equal to P star. So we've dropped the back pressure to that, that critical sonic pressure. Now at this point, what happens is the Mach number right at the exit is equal to P star. I'm sorry, is equal to, that doesn't make any sense. The Mach number right at the exit there is equal to 1 in this case because now it's the it's the sonic pressure, so that means the, the Mach number is 1 there. So if you look in the, no, in the converging nozzle, you see the pressure decreases. It's all subsonic in here. This whole region, the Mach number is subsonic. The pressure drops as the Mach number increases. You can prove that, actually, through Bernoulli's equation. If, if you have an increasing velocity, the pressure will go down. It's just from Bernoulli's equation. And so you can see um, you know, the Mach number is... In, is is subsonic here, um, but because we're dropping the back pressure, the, the flow starts to pick up, but the pressure will decrease because the, the velocity is increasing. We're at this critical case where the back pressure is exactly equal to P star. We now get a Mach number of 1 right at the throat. The flow is now choked. Okay, So if I was going to show you where we are in, on this picture in the upper right, we've dropped the back pressure to this point, so we're now here where the the pressure at the throat is equal to P star as well. Okay, we're right at this critical point. As far as the mass flow rate, we're at right at this point. We're at our maximum mass flow rate, which is just the choked flow mass flow rate. Okay. Now let me go ahead and drop the pressure a little bit further. So I can continue to drop the back pressure. Let me do that one. We'll do that one in green. So now my back pressure is down here. 
So what ends up happening in that case? Well, anything upstream of the throat is unaffected because we can't propagate those sound waves further upstream. So inside the converging nozzle, it still follows this line. And we still have a Mach number one right at the exit. It's, it's still going to be choked flow conditions, right? So if we go back up on the plot in the upper right, let's say we're here. What ends up happening is the pressure right at the throat is still P star. It's nothing from the throat upwards, nothing has changed because none of that information gets propagated upstream. So it's still P star at the throat. The Mach number at the throat is still one. And as far as the mass flow rate, you know, we're, just, we're somewhere here it's still just the choked flow mass flow rate. It's not going to change because as far as the tank is concerned, the back pressure still you know, has, hasn't changed. It doesn't realize it's changed. But you see that in this picture down here, I've drawn this kind of squiggly lines, you know, some, some sort of weird lines there. What ends up happening outside uh, of the nozzle is you get some strange behavior. You get what are known as expansion fans. Now that's a topic we're not going to cover in this course that would be covered in a more advanced, um, or at least analysis of expansion waves are covered in a more advanced uh, gas dynamics course. But what ends up happening is as, as the flow comes out of that nozzle, it the, the, the pressure at the throat is higher than the back pressure. So what ends up happening is the flow expands as it comes out because the pressure difference, there's a big pressure difference. The flow automatically just kind of blooms out. And it'll look something like this picture I've shown right up here. So here's a converging nozzle. Flow is going this way. You can see right at this point, the Mach number would be one, actually. This is hard to see, let me change the color. Mach number is one right at that, that throat. And then as the flow comes out, the, you can see the flow expands outward. And those are called expansion fans. I, I tried to show that uh, schematically here, that here, right at the throat, the Mach number is equal to one, so the throat pressure is P star, but here the back pressure is less than P star, and so the flow expands outward as it comes out. So that's called an, an expansion fan. And the behavior, trying to plot what the pressure looks like in that expansion fan is, is complex, and so we're not going to do that. And the way I just show it graphically is just with this kind of squiggly line. It, it just, it's a, something outside the scope of this course. So it's fine to just draw it as a squiggly line. And eventually it comes into equilibrium with the surrounding pressure, the back pressure. But uh, for our purposes, we can just draw a squiggly line there just to show that there goes through this kind of complex behavior. Um, we just don't know the details of it at this point. So for this converging nozzle, the real critical point to figure out what's going on is you have to know how the back pressure compares to P star. Right? Now remember, I've, I've talked about this before. It's, it's kind of good to know, like if you're dealing with air, which has a specific heat ratio of 1.4, that number comes out to be, I think it's 0.5283. So if we have a, a tank, like what we have here, and I drop the back pressure to P star over P naught of about a half here. So if, if I drop the back pressure to P star relative to P naught here, then we will get choked flow conditions. And we'll get a Mach number of one right at that exit. So, so if this tank is at atmospheric pressure, if I drop the back pressure to uh, 0.53, or I'm sorry, 0.52, then what ends up happening is we'll get a Mach number of one here. Okay, or you could think of it the other way. If this is the, the back pressure is atmospheric pressure, if I have a tank that's roughly twice atmospheric pressure, when I discharge that tank, we'll reach Mach number of one here, and it'll be at sonic conditions. So you don't have to pressurize things that much. Actually, one interesting thing is if you think about a soda can, they're pressurized. And I've read somewhere where the pressure in that soda can is, is on the order of three to five times atmospheric pressure. So when you first open up that soda can, as the gas escapes, it actually has a Mach number of one for a brief period of time. It doesn't stay that way because as the gas escapes, the stagnation pressure inside the can quickly drops because there's just not that much volume. But for a, for a brief uh, period of time, you actually have a sonic flow coming out of that, that can because the, the stagnation pressure is higher than uh, is much higher than the back pressure enough high enough to cause sonic conditions right at the throat. 
Okay, so um, now one kind of interesting application of having choked flow is, uh, let's say you had a, a pressure line and that goes into a number of different labs. This is, this is pretty common in like a research lab situation. You have a, a, a compressed air line and it branches off into a bunch of different labs. But what you don't want to do is you don't want your lab to be affected by somebody's um, experiment in a different lab. You know, if you're all using the compressed air line, what you don't want to do is, is you don't want your compressed air line to be affected by somebody else. Maybe you've got some Yahoo in the other lab that's constantly, you know, turning knobs and things like that and changing the, the pressure conditions. You don't want that to affect your experiment. So the way that you can prevent their experiment from impacting yours is you choke the flow between the two labs. What you do is you would choke the flow going into their laboratory. So any sort of perturbations they make wouldn't propagate upstream and then make their way into your laboratory. So choking the flow can just cut down on that communication between labs. So that's one practical application of that. Um, okay, so I think that was really all I wanted to describe about these, um, these um, flow, the flow through a converging nozzle situation. So what I want you to take away from this lecture is just physically the, the concept of what's causing choked flow. It's just that, that propagation of information upstream. The idea that you can get a choked flow and it would be a good idea if you can keep in mind, I'm going to erase some of this stuff because it's a mess, but I'd like you to keep in mind, or, or I should say fully understand what's happening in these plots here, uh, especially this one. I think it's really important that you understand what's, what's causing, why the plot looks the way it does. So make sure you try to really understand that. And then the last thing that I want you to take away is to know that um, in order to get these choked flow conditions, the back pressure, what you want to do is you want to check the back pressure against the P star value. Because once, once the back pressure is equal to P star here, then the flow becomes choked, and then uh, any further decrease in the back pressure has no impact on what's happening upstream. Now, everything I've described here is only for a converging nozzle. Okay, When we have a converging diverging nozzle, then it gets more complex. The, the, the critical behavior is different, okay? or the critical back pressure is different. Here, it was just checking the back pressure against P star, but when it's converging diverging nozzle, it's more complicated than that. Oh, and by the way, um, you know, I showed this picture of the expansion of the flow coming out through the nozzle. I just want to refer back to this original picture. You can see that same expansion occurring here. So we know immediately that the flow coming out of those nozzles are actually choked, that there's a, there's a choked flow condition here. And we know the Mach number right at the exit plane is equal to one. And if we knew the geometry of what was happening inside the nozzle, we could find the Mach number everywhere inside that nozzle and the pressure, et cetera, from the isentropic relations. The flow through this whole, through this whole nozzle here is all isentropic. So we can use our isentropic relations to see what's happening here. If you wanted to find, um, you know, the pressure somewhere, or the temperature, or, or uh, any of that, uh, you, can, you can get it from the isentropic relations. And I go through some examples in separate videos where you can see how we uh, do those kinds of calculations. I won't do them here, but definitely look at the examples so you can see how we apply these uh, relations for a converging nozzle. Okay, so in the next lecture, what we'll do is we'll talk about normal shock waves, um, and then from there, we'll talk about converging and diverging nozzles. Okay, so that's what's on tap for the next couple of videos.